folks, welcome back to my YouTube channel. In the previous videos, we have covered what an MLOps landscape looks like, what are the different components that form a part of your MLOps pipeline, and we also discussed some of the top tools that come for each of the different stack components. If you remember, the last tool that we discussed was DVC, which was used as a data versioning component. So it's just one implementation of the data versioning component. And today we'll be talking about something called data annotation. So this is a topic which receives slightly less attention as compared to the other topics in the MLOps arena. So we'll be talking about what data annotation is and why it is important so that you get the motivation behind it. And then we'll also look at a tool that allows you to annotate your data effortlessly. So to begin, let me first uh, give you an intuitive understanding of what data annotation is. So think of annotation in terms of adding meaning to some raw data. So you need some data to actually train the ML model. But how do you make this model make sense of data that is done through data annotation? So to give you some concrete examples to help you understand better, let's talk about the healthcare industry. So the healthcare industry, you may find use cases like um, annotating X-ray images or MRI images. So what you do is you basically annotate parts of that image and identify those things so that your model understands what this image is. And then you can train your model better. That is one use case. Another use case could be say in the self-driving car industry. So you can annotate stuff like pedestrians or road signs, other cars or whatever other things can let it appear on your road. So that's also part of annotation. And it is not just limited to annotating image data. It can also be text data. For example, um, let's talk about the retail industry. Giants like Amazon and Flipkart use text annotation to figure out what is the sentiment behind all the reviews that they get on the products. So there's also something which is useful uh, for a model. So once you have the idea of what data annotation is, we can then move on to actually figuring out a tool or using a tool to annotate some real data. Right? So without wasting any more time, let me jump into this tool called V7. So here you can see this is the dashboard. So this is what you see when you first log in to V7. I already have some data sets here, but I'll be going through each of these different sections independently. We'll see what the sections are. And then finally, we'll look at an example to see all of the good features in action. All right, so the first section here is data sets. And this is where you upload all of the data that you want to update. So you can see I already have a traffic data set here with some CCTV footages from the highways. But you can also create new data set using this form here. So you can just type in a name, add some data, and then go about it. We'll be going over this flow again when we look at the example. So I'm just trying to give you some idea of what this looks like. Right. So the next section is the workflow section, which is a really cool feature in my opinion. It just allows you to create and define multiple steps that have some relationship with each other. And you can do all of that in a user interface. So these steps can be the data sets, can be the models. So you can leverage all of these features in defining one workflow, which is reusable. So I can go from a data set to then the next step could be annotation. The third step would be review, and then you can have a model trained on the data once it is reviewed. So all of that can be defined as a single workflow, and that is really handy. The next section is classes. So this allows you to define different labels that you want to assign to your data. So here you can see I have a car section, sorry, car label here. But you can also define them dynamically when you actually enter your data. So when you go into that uh, section where you define an entry data, you can also dynamically create new labels. So you don't have to create them right now. The next section is the model section. So this has a number of public models and you can also register your own models, which you can train on the data set that you have annotated. So this is also something which is worth checking out. You can use the uh, form here to select what kind of model you want to train, select the name of the model, and then you can just select the data set that you have annotated and then it can go about the flow. So right now we don't have enough labels for the training had to happen. So I'll just skip this part for now, but you can try it out yourself. The next section is the annotator section where you can see a high level idea of how many jobs have been annotated and who has done those jobs. You can also request new annotators for your data. So if you don't have enough uh, workforce yourself, you can just request uh, using this formula. All right, since we've now completed the entire sections, we can just go through one of the examples. So I'll go into the traffic data set that I have right now, or rather I'll just create a new data set here so that you understand what the flow looks like. So what I can do is I will say traffic new, right? So this will allow me to upload some new files here. Let me just quickly upload three of the same traffic data files. And now you can see there's this form that comes up. It allows you to select what frame rate you want for each of your video files. So you can either keep the native frame rate or you can choose any custom frame rate you want. I'll let me just select 15 for now. And there's also an option to annotate as video or as individual images. When you select this option, V7 will then take your video and split it into different images. So that's also one way you can do it. But I'll just use the video because I have something cool to show you with the video stuff. And I can keep the same settings for all the three different videos that I have here. 
So once data is uploaded, I can go into the next step, which is data set classes. So here you can define what kind of classes you want to assign to your data, basically. So you can create a new class here. So maybe I can, uh, or maybe I can just skip it at this point and we'll do that later on. So you just save and continue. And here you can pick a workflow. So this is where you can define a workflow. So maybe I'll just pick the basic template, uh, which is the basic workflow. All right, so once you have uploaded uh, all your data and you have selected a workflow, we can then get started with our annotation jobs. So I'll just open up one of the files here. Or maybe I'll just go to the next one because this looks a bit cleaner to me. At the bottom here, you can see there are multiple frames that we send has already populated. So for video format uh, files, we send automatically creates a timeline for you. And you can just drag this cursor here to select one of the individual frames, uh, sample at the frame that you select, basically. Now what I can do is this, I can just go into any each of these frames and annotate all of my uh, objects here. So to that, there's this entire uh, section here, which you can find on the left. There are multiple tools here. I'll be going through all of them at a very high level just to make, make you understand what are the options you have for annotation. So the first is the edit tool, which basically allows you to move that image or select any parts of the image. The second is the auto annotate tool, which is one of my favorite tools. And this allows you to automatically select uh, the boundaries for whatever objects you have. So we'll be looking at that later on. Um, the next step is the polygon tool. This allows you to define different polygons uh, around your uh, image. So maybe what I can do is I can show you how that is done. So maybe I'll click on the polygon tool. I'll go through this thing. I'll just define multiple points here. So all of these points form the boundary for my object, right? So I can define any custom shape I want with this. So once you've selected any particular um, object, then you have the option to specify a class for it. Right? So I didn't create any classes or labels before, as you remember. So I can do that now. I'll add a new class and I can say car. And you can see the annotation type is automatically polygon because that is the kind of annotation I've done. And then you can set other attributes. You can add a description and as if you want it, you can add a thumbnail and then you can do add class. So once I add a class here, uh, okay, there's, there's already a class which exists. So maybe I'll do car two here. So once this is done, you can then start annotating other uh, cars with the same tool. So you can see there's a car to label which comes up on the top here. You can set what class you want and then you can start annotating all of your different classes. So this is how you use the polygon tool. The next step is the brush tool, which is again similar. You just have to paint a particular section that you want to add a class to. And then we prompted to also add different classes. So you see there's already a car to label which is automatically applied to it. But you also have options to change the brush size and all the different customizations that you want. There's also a bounding box tool, which is also super handy. You can just convert all this. So basically a polygon uh, class can be converted to any of the different other classes. So you remember I started off with polygon and defined a car to label for the polygon class. But then as I select the different uh, kinds of tools that I have, different kinds of options I have for annotation, you can see that the box actually changes to actually match whatever category I'm using right now. So with the bonding box, I have this thing, but I can also create new bonding boxes, which are much better defined. And I can also create new classes specifically for the bonding box uh, category. So once that is done, so I'll just quickly go through the rest of these. So there's an ellipse tool, there's a line tool, so you can use it to maybe annotate the dividers and stuff like that. There's also a common tool, which you can use when you're talking to different teammates uh, on the same portal. But on a high level, these are what you have. These are some of the most popular options to annotate your data. So now what I can do is this, I'll just get rid of um, this annotation and maybe we can start off with annotating some of our data here. So what I can do is maybe I select the bounding box to begin with. I'll select one of these cars here and I'll add a new class. So this class is called a car, which is a bounding box type. I'll add this class. Perfect. So what I can do now is I can keep selecting more cars here. So whatever box I select to be annotated with that car option. There you go. So I have three cars now here. So this is really handy and you can select for how long you want, for how many frames you want this annotation to stand. And by what, what I mean by that is if I drag my cursor throughout this section, you can see that the car annotation is persistent across multiple frames. But there's one problem, but there's one obvious problem that the cars have now shifted their positions. There's no longer a car in this particular frame here. So how do you handle that? So usually the natural way of doing that would be to go into each of these frames and then adjust all of your parameters here. Basically, that is how to do it. Now this looks like a tedious process, right? So you have to go into every frame and then you have to select 
and you have to adjust the position of your bonding box depending on the position of the object in that frame right so thankfully there's a feature called interpolate so you can see there's uh, interpolate option here at the right which is enabled by default so what this means is that once i have adjusted the bonding box at this particular image at this particular frame then all of the frames between these have automatically taken up the entire flow how cool is that so you don't have to go into each of this frame to manually adjust all your bonding boxes but just annotate the ends and then the rest of this are auto auto interpolated automatically by v7 so that is really really cool and comes in really handy with the uh, video features i'm really happy about that i just zoom in a bit to show you there's this thing which is called a keyframe so whenever you edit any particular frame you get this option here which is the keyframe so basically it just says that you have made some customization at this particular frame so what i can do is i can even go to the end of this frame and then i can also adjust my annotations again so it's up to date right i just put it here and now if i play the entire section you can see that the bonding box follows my car perfectly all right so this is done now another way of selecting your objects for annotating them is through this tool called auto annotate now this is a really cool feature that I already discussed and what this does is basically figures out the bounds or the edges of your object itself without you having to manually define them. So to demonstrate that we are going to this frame here. You just have to select the region which has your object. There's, there needs to be some margin around the actual object and then you have to just wait and then you can see V7 has already calculated the edges in the exact way for this car. Now, as with the other um, way of uh, doing annotation, if you just move this frame, you can see that this annotated uh, area has been left behind. So all you have to do now is just to click on rerun. So this will now add just again to the car's position in the new frame. So this is again the same way and all of the points between these two points have automatically been calculated for you. So this is again the same as interpolation with the other um, categories. So once you have done with all of your annotation job, you can then click on send to annotate. So this is part of the workflow which I showed you earlier. So when I click on send to annotate, I can then let's say send to review. So all of that is now a process uh, which is part of the workflow. So maybe just to give you a better idea, better look to that, what I can do is I can go into the workflow set tab here. So this workflow tab can show you how many of the files you have in your data set, how many of them have been completed and how many are in progress. So what I can do is I can see there's, this is the one which I have been working on before. So this is being annotated, which is this label. You can also see there's this in review. So I went to the review stage for this particular file here. So what I can do is I can also open this. It will open up in the review uh, section. So you can see there's a review uh, label here. So I can just say mark as complete. So I'm the reviewer now and I'm marking this uh, job as complete. So if I go back to the workflow, I can then see that there should be one completed job. So there's one completed job. There's one in progress. So anybody can do that. So it is not supposed to be you, the same person is annotating the job, but you can also assign people from your team to actually do the review for you. So once annotation is done, once review is completed, then the next step is completion. So all of that is part of this workflow here. So once this process is complete, we can also take a look at the quality tab here. So this gives you a high level idea of what your dataset looks like, what are the different classes in your dataset and how many instances of the classes you have. Uh, for example, let's say for car 2, I have 30 instances and 30 comes from different frames that I have in all the videos that I have. So basically it gives you an estimation of how many more classes, how many more instances of the classes you want for your model to be trained perfectly. So you can see it says low data right now, which is because I have less than 100 instances of this particular class and this is not sufficient for my model to be trained in a meaningful way. So this gives you a very nice idea of how much uh, data you want to collect more. Right, so this is really handy. I love this uh, tab here. So you can also have settings where you can cite and you can find URLs for all of your data sets because right now this is an education plan. So all of my data sets are public and that's why uh, it shows you the URL for it. Okay, so once you're content with the data that you have, you can also start exporting it. So there's an export data tab on the right top here. So you can see there's again the public URL which we saw earlier that you can use to share data. Or you can also create an export here in multiple file formats. So you can see the JSON format is selected right now, but you can also have different formats which are specific to the kind of data you are annotating, right? So there's also Pascal work, which is for the bonding boxes. So you can find out what suits best for you. And there's also handy tags here, which says, which is the slowest, which is high, which is faster. So all of that is also really helpful. 
you can specify a name for whatever uh, uh, you want to call this particular uh, SQL data set and you can export this item. So this will download your um, data to your particular local machine and then you can use that in multiple ways. Alright, so with this example, I think we've covered a lot of the features that we send us to offer. So we took a look at the video annotation features and how we can use interpolation to actually carry your annotated area across multiple frames. We also took a look at different kinds of categories that you can use like the auto annotate feature which is super cool. Then there's also bounding boxes, polygon tool and other stuff that you can make use of while you're covering your regions in your data. So with that, let's now talk about the team and the collaboration features. So I already showed you in the workflows earlier that you can assign people in different parts of your workflow. So let's talk about, let's say the annotation part. So you can see anyone can annotate this data and basically I'm the only user in this workspace here, but I can add people to my team and then assign them specific jobs and also assign specific reviewers in this case. So all of that is really handy and you can totally uh, see how that will be used in settings like uh, in education institutions where you can have certain reviewers which are professors and then there are people who actually edit data like which are research uh, uh, scholars and all those guys. So that's the idea behind uh, the team management and there's multiple other features. You can go into the settings here, you can select what plan you have and then you can select how many members you can add to your team. So if you want to add new people here, you can just add their email and then select what kind of role you want to assign them to. So all that is really, really cool. All right, to conclude, we looked at the video annotation side of the story with V7 and it also includes image annotation because ultimately we just are a set of multiple images put together. So you now understand how to use the various um, options and tools that V7 has to offer to do video and image annotation. But I wanted to point out that there's much more that can be achieved and most of that is present in the documentation here. So if you go into the V7 labs documentation, you see they have extensive guides on multiple use cases plus there's information on all the tools we've discussed so far. So there's auto annotate and other things as well. There's also a CLI that comes with it and a Python library that we didn't get a chance to look at in this video, but it's worth checking out as well. In addition, there's also a blog, which I really like because it gives you an understanding of multiple use cases in the AI world and it's mostly well researched. So if you want to skill up on your annotation skills, do check out this blog. Um, there's, I think I have been, been, been through a few of these blogs, but I don't have any favorites so far but definitely uh, worth checking it out. So that's it for the video. Um, if you have any suggestions, if you want to see any more use cases with the V7 tool, you let me know. And in the future, we'll be covering even for more tools in the Mlops landscape, plus different kinds of stack components as well. So that's it for the video. I'll see you on the next one. Thank you so much for watching.